Hi, my name's Andy, and this is a video about character encodings. Um, things like Unicode, UTF-8, ASCII, uh, UTF-16, UTF-32, a few other weird ones. Um, if that sounds boring, uh, I understand that. Uh, I think it sort of sounds boring to me, but actually, I really need to tell you, I've had so much fun preparing this talk. It's so interesting. Uh, it has so many weird little quirks. Um, I've really, really enjoyed it. Um, I think one of the reasons I've enjoyed it so much is because I've always known that there was some um, there's some stuff around this that I didn't understand that I kind of vaguely knew there was um, things I should understand about this to know how my code was working in various situations and actually to sort of unfuzzy that and make it uh, clear it's just a really satisfying feeling like the fog clearing uh, also it's just this really quirky stuff so uh, let's see how it goes um, so I'm going to talk about the concepts, the ideas, um, the general idea of what we're doing with encoding and decoding um, so-called characters in so-called encodings. Um, I'll go through some of the words and what they mean and hopefully um, if you can get them into your head that makes, uh, it, that, that in a way that's sort of half the problem, just knowing what, what word means what. Um, then what I'll do is I'll take you through some examples of some of the uh, most interesting characters that I've found that, that show us different um, examples of what happens in Unicode and stuff. Once we've seen some examples, we'll get into uh, actually how the most important character encodings work. Um, and that'll be mostly that. So, let's start with concepts. So, essentially, what I'm talking about is how to turn uh, bytes or bi you know, binary data that um, is in your computer memory or uh, came over the network into something that has some meaning for a human. Um, so essentially, when we decode some stuff, it, it turns from bytes into meaning, and when we encode stuff, it turns from meaning into bytes. Uh, notice that I'm calling them bytes slash octets. Uh, uh, so let's break that down a little bit more. So well, um, I'm going to go through these things and explain uh, how I understand them. But yeah, we go from bytes to things called code units, uh, which are data, uh, to things called code points, uh, to things which may be called characters, if you really, if depending what you mean. And then there's a couple of more fuzzy transitions that can happen um, from these sort of fairly concrete characters into something else that also might be called characters, um, or things that get drawn, which are called glyphs. Uh, and ways of drawing whole loads of stuff, which are called fonts, and then at some in some vague way that we don't understand, uh, that stuff gets transformed into meaning. Uh, but we don't care about meaning. Uh, we're programmers. We'll leave meaning to the humans. Um, also, we don't care about um, characters, glyphs, and fonts. I mean, that's just how you draw stuff. That's not the really cool bit. So we're going to um, restrict ourselves to bytes, code units, code points, and then depending what you mean by character, characters. So let's start off with just some vocabulary to understand and it should get us, um, as I said, get us a long way into understanding what's really going on. First of all, uh, let's talk bytes. Well, the really the thing to say here is that we probably should avoid using the word bytes because bytes sometimes means um, different things depending on, on some computer architectures. When you talked about a byte, it wasn't actually 8 bits. So um, the word that's been chosen to try and make that as clear as possible is octets. So um, if I'm talking about just some binary data made out of 8-bit chunks, those are octets, um, which are often called bytes. Um, just a, a side note on octets. Um, sometimes you'll see the phrase octet string. Uh, sounds clever. It's just a list of octets. Uh, okay, so here's the first word that you might um, that you need to really get the hang of uh, to understand, especially Unicode stuff. Um, there are these things called code units, and what code units are um, are data. So they're not something useful yet. So when we get to code points, those are kind of useful bits of information for a human. A code unit is just some data. Um, I've drawn it as um, um, zeros and ones to try and get that across. So. A code unit is a number of octets, or at least um, some binary data of a fixed size. Um, so in UTF-8, the code units are 8 bits. That's why UTF-8 is called UTF-8. 
In UTF-16, the code units are 16 bits. So one code unit is made out of two octets. In UTF-32, one code unit is made out of four octets. Now, actually, there are some uh, encodings where the code units are not made out of a whole number of octets. So it could be, say, for example, seven bits or something like that. But in general, especially when we're talking Unicode, you can just think of it as um, a fixed size chunk of binary data uh, made out of some octets. So a code unit is is uh, within one encoding, like UTF-8, a code unit is always going to be the same size. Um, it's just a bit of data. But then we've got this more complicated thing, but more useful, which is called a code point. A code point um, is not some number of bits or something like that. A code point is a a, let's call it for the sake of argument, character. It's a thing, this is a word that's mostly used in Unicode, and it means a thing like the letter A. So um, often the code points are written U plus, and then some hexadecimal numbers. Um, so for example, U plus 0041 means the capital letter A. So a code point refers to an actual uh, character, or you know thing that might get written on the page, depending on how you define that. Um, and in Unicode, a code point will be made out of one or more code units. Um, so code units, as, are, as I just said, are fixed size. Code points could be made out of one code unit. A code point could be made out of one unit, or it could be made out of four code units, or whatever. So um, that depends what character you're talking about, how it gets encoded. But a code point is not an encoding. It's not a way of writing down a character in bits or bytes, or octets, a code point is this kind of abstract idea um, of a character like the capital letter A. So U plus 0041, that's not, some, that's not encoding, that's not um, bytes, that is just our abstract concept. That's the way we, as humans, refer to that capital letter A when we're talking Unicode. Um, yeah, so not data, but, ca but then an encoding is a way of writing down in an unambiguous way um, what that code, uh, the, which code point we're referring to, um, we'll get to that. It's going to make sense, honestly. Um, and then uh, characters. So um, characters is a really hard word, as you may have picked up from me. Um, and sometimes you can think, generally, fairly often, you can think of, um, uh, you can kind of roughly throw out the idea of a character and just talk about code points. We'll see some examples where actually one character, as a human would talk about it, is made out of multiple code points, but often for um, Latin letters, one code point is essentially the same thing as one character. Um, they're not really one-to-one -one at all. Um, loads and loads of stuff happens with diacritics and things where you need multiple code points to get kind of stuck together to make a character. Okay, so let's look at some examples, and hopefully this will all become clear. So I'm gonna sort of jump you straight in with a whole load of encodings here. Um, we'll talk about these encodings in much more detail later. Um, so don't worry about all these numbers. Uh, these are to give you a general impression. So first of all, the first example we're looking at is the character I've already talked about a couple of times, which is Latin capital letter A, or at least that's what the Unicode character set, or universal character set, um, which is its technical name, um, that's how it describes this character. So Latin capital letter A, so Latin as in it's from... Um, the Latin, the, it's from the set of letters which are called Latin, um, which are the, the, the commonly used ones in English. Um, so that top line shows you how the character gets written, and then the Unicode code point number, so it's U plus 0041, and then the name. And then below that top line, all the other lines are how to write that in bytes, uh, or octets, in different encodings. So you can see in UTF-8, it's one byte, you can see the binary of it there on the right hand side uh, and then down that first column you can see that how to write it in hexadecimal so to get the capital letter A in UTF-8 it only takes you one byte and that byte is 65 in um, uh, in decimal or 41 in hexadecimal and you can see a few more encodings so there's a couple of ways of writing UTF-16 below and then there's UTF-32 so UTF-32 um, is one 32-bit code unit to write this one letter, 
So the 32 bits is four octets, and the four octets are zero, 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 and and then four one. So similar to what we saw before. You can see four one is cropping up a lot. Uh, then in ASCII, the capital letter A is also four one. So exactly the same as in UTF-8. And then there's a few more encodings down there, uh, which we'll talk about in a sec. So another example. Latin small letter E with acute. Um, so this uh, looks like a little letter E with a, an acute accent on top of it. Uh, the Unicode code point number for that is U plus zero zero E nine. And then you can see its name there. So in UTF-8, uh, that's written with two bytes. Uh, you can see the binary for them on the right hand side and the hexadecimal for that same number, uh, C3A9. Um, so that is two code units because in UTF-8 the code units are octets. So we've got two of them, um, but one code point. So those two code units, C3A9, are um, working together to, to encode one code point and the code point is U plus 00E9. Um, then below you can see a couple of UTF-16 um, encodings. Those are both one code unit, because code units in UTF-16 are, are 16 bits, so two octets. So that's, that's one code unit. And then in UTF-32 it's one code unit, which is 32 bit, with a load of zeros and then an E9. So in UTF-32 you can see um, the encoding looks a lot like the code point number. Those, those map, match up nicely. So if we keep going down and look at US ASCII, which is just ASCII, uh, or you may be more familiar with calling it ASCII, um, the uh, Latin small letter E with acute can't be written in ASCII, um, but it can be written in uh, ISO 8859-1, uh, which is also called Latin 1, one of the most common encodings um, that you come across if you're not using Unicode, uh, at least in Western, Western computers. Um, so ISO 8859-1, uh, often called Latin 1, uh, if you put E9 in, um, in that encoding, um, you actually get the Latin small letter E with acute. Um, you can notice that uh, in Latin 7, which is ISO 8859-7, you can't uh, write this letter, and then some of the others you can. So another example, uh, Greek capital letter Omega. So this is an Omega character from for when you're writing Greek. Um, you can see its code point number there at the top. You can write that in UTF-8 with two bytes, two octets, two code units. You can write it in UTF-16 with one code unit, but it's twice as long. Um, you can't write it in ASCII. You can't write it in Latin 1, ISO 8859-1, but you can write it in Latin 7, ISO 8859-7. Latin 7, or 8859-7, uh, is an encoding that is designed to give you all the ASCII characters and also uh, the Greek characters. So uh, if you're using that encoding Latin 7 or 8859-7, uh, you can just write D9, just one byte, um, and you get the capital Omega. Uh, you, can, you can also write it in some other encodings below. Um, now this is one of my favorite character names that I've come across while I've been researching this talk. This character, um, it, its name in Unicode is CJK Radical Mother. Now, I was talking to someone about this the other day and they told me, uh, I think CJK is like which set of Chinese characters we're talking about. Um, and this, this character can be used to write mother. Um, but in order to write mother, you have to write it twice. Um, and the, the radical part, even though I like it because I like the idea of a radical mother, but, um, the radical part means that this character can be written, this character and then some other character, to, and it has a different meaning. But if you write it twice, um, it means mother. I think that's right. I apologies if I got that wrong. So in UTF-8, in order to write CJK radical mother, you need three code units to write this one code point. So it takes three bytes in UTF-8 to write it, or three octets. Uh, in UTF-16, you only need to use one code unit, but that code unit is made out of two octets because it's a 16-bit code unit. In UTF-32, you only need one code unit. Um, most of the other encodings we've been looking at can't write this character, but GB18030 can write this character. Uh, it takes four octets, 
Um, I think that's two 16-bit code units, but I'm not actually completely sure which GB18030 encoder I'm using here. Um, uh, yeah, GB18030 is um, a set of standards created by the Chinese government, which you're most likely to come across if you're outside um, of China. If you are making software that the Chinese government is going to use, they if you're making software the Chinese government is going to use, they want you to support GB18030 standards. And one of those, or actually several of those standards, are a character set and several encodings um, that are... Um, uh, that you need to support if you're going to sell stuff to them um, that let you encode a lot of Chinese stuff. And the set of characters that are supported is actually um, reasonably similar to most of the stuff you can find in Unicode, but the way you encode it is quite different. Um, maybe you don't care, maybe you do. If you do decent Unicode handling, you're probably okay for your GB18030 encoding, so long as you remember to actually provide that as an encoding. Uh, now, probably my current favorite Unicode character. Presentation form for vertical right white lenticular bracket, spelt wrong. Because yes, this character, uh, U plus FE18, uh, you might think it's quite an ordinary character. It's just a vertical right white lenticular bracket, whatever that is. Um, but you will notice the word bracket in its name is spelt wrong. That is its official canonical uh, universal character set name which will never change um, it does actually have an alias which is presentation form for vertical right white lenticular bracket where bracket is spelt correctly but the official canonical forever never changing name of this character includes an incorrect spelling of the word bracket and I find that uh, almost infinitely pleasing um, uh, in order to write this again it takes three code units in UTF-8 takes one code unit in UTF-16, but it's a 16-bit code unit. Uh, this is also writable in GB18030, so you're starting to get the idea that GB18030 um, can do quite a lot of characters in Unicode, even some quite obscure ones like this. Um, uh, here's another example. Um, notice that I actually had to make an image uh, of this character because it wouldn't render quite properly uh, in my browser. Um, this is an example of a character that's made out of multiple code units. So this is, now let me try and get this right, this is a Latin small letter I with Ogonek, but also with a combining dot above and a combining acute accent. So the Ogonek I think is the thing underneath the I, the little wiggle. Um, so it's an I with that little wiggle underneath, that's the first code point, but then we've stuck onto that a combining dot above and a combining acute accent. And if you can make both of those out, well done. Um, so that's the letter that's uh, used, a uh, perfectly normal letter to use in certain um, languages and scripts. Um, in order to be able to write that using Unicode, you have to take three code points and stick them together. That's one character, it, if, that, if, you mean, if by character you mean like thing that you write as part of a word, um, it takes three code points to write. So in UTF-8, um, it takes six octets, um, because each of those code points takes two octets to write. So the C4AF is the first code point written using two code units, and then there's two more code units, uh, two more code points, each of which takes two code units. Um, you can see you can also write that in UTF-16, UTF-32, and GB18030. If you think I'm just skipping over this stuff, don't worry. These are, I'm showing you examples, and in a minute I'll talk about how these encodings work, at least the Unicode ones I'm going to go into proper detail with. Okay, possibly my second favourite Unicode character, until everyone else heard about it. Uh, this is a Unicode character which is called Pile of Poo. Um, it's an official part of the Unicode standard. Um, it's... It's the symbol for a pile of poo. It's often used to mean uh, that's not very good. Um, uh, I, I really like it. Um, the uni Unicode code point number for it uh, is, is U plus 1F4A9. So U plus just means this is a code point number. Uh, and then 1F4A9 is a hexadecimal number. So basically all those, all those characters in Unicode, which is uh, called the universal character set, they all have a number. Uh, it's normally written in hexadecimal with a U plus before it. So a pile of poo in UTF-8 takes four octets to write, but it's only one code point. So it's four code units that are combining together to encode one code point. 
Whereas in UTF-16, it's two 16-bit code units to write. And in UTF-32, it's one 32-bit code unit to write. So you can look at UTF-32 line there and you can see um, it actually has one F for A9 as part of the encoding. So in UTF-32, the code point number maps really directly into uh, the actual binary code unit that's written on disk or in memory or wherever it is. Notice that um, Pile of Poo is also writable in GB18030, uh, the official Chinese government standard encoding, which is useful if you need to say a Pile of Poo. Um, one more, this is our last example. Um, this is another example of things that combine uh, code point, two code points combining to make one character. This is um, the Unicode character adult, which is an emoji for like an adult person. Um, but it's combined together with a character called emoji, or rather code point called emoji modifier Fitzpatrick type 6. So the Fitzpatrick uh, classifications are skin color classifications. Um, so in uh, Unicode, there are code points for uh, several of the different uh, skin colors recognized by this Fitzpatrick um, standard uh, or classification. So here we're using type 6. So that means that uh, what that the emoji modifier does is modifies the skin tone of the previous character. So if you just write adult and you don't provide a Fitzpatrick uh, modifier, um, it'll, it'll draw it, or the, the standard says you should draw that um, using a kind of non-human skin tone, like yellow or something like that, uh, that's clearly, uh, clearly doesn't have a kind of known skin tone. If you provide a Fitzpatrick modifier, you can say what... Uh, skin tone that the previous character should have. Um, so this is uh, lots of fun because there are, these are, this is two code points and in UTF-8 both of those code points take four code units to encode. So there's eight bytes of UTF-8 to write this. Um, so the first four bytes of that UTF-8 encoding are the first code unit um, and the second four bytes are the second code unit. Um, and then similarly, in UTF-16, both of these code points require two UTF-16 code units, 16-bit code units uh, to write. But then in UTF-32, this is just two, two code units uh, to, to make the two code points. All this is also representable in GB18030, uh, but not the others. Um, yeah, so um, we... I skimmed over some of the encodings towards the bottom there, but I will talk about some of them later. So, a few more words. A character set is a list of characters. So the Unicode character set is a list of uh, millions and millions of characters, whereas the ASCII character set is a list of just 128 characters. Uh, and in, So a character set is just um, like, which characters am I talking about? An encoding is how to turn characters into bytes and bytes into characters. And then there is this word called code page, uh, which used to be used for older encodings, not used so much for Unicode and stuff like that. And that really means a character set and an encoding just combined together into one thing. Um, so here are some example character sets, uh, character encodings, or code pages. So ASCII is the one that a lot of these other stuff, these other things are based on. Uh, in ASCII, the, there are 128 characters, um, so they all fit into seven bits. So often ASCII is written with a, a zero and then seven useful bits. Um, loads of this stuff is based on this, including all the Unicode stuff. Um, inside those 128 characters, you've got the Latin letters, A to Z, and capital A to Z, and the numbers. You've got common punctuation, brackets, curly brackets, dots, semicolon, stuff like that. You've also got some weird things, which are called control characters, which are things like backspace and stuff like that. And that's part of ASCII. And sometimes it's hard to know what that would mean. Um, uh, yep, yeah, so then the, the next code page, which is um, we've seen a lot in old Western uh, setups, uh, is this thing which we often call Latin 1, but which is properly called ISO 8859-1. That's a code page that uses all 8 bits. Um, it includes all the ASCII stuff, uh, except the weird ASCII characters which are not included. Uh, so in total there are 191, so there's some gaps there which aren't used. Um, it's basically um, ASCII plus some stuff that um, someone using a Western 
computer might find useful. Um, then there's also a load of other Latin something else, including Latin 7 that we were looking at earlier. So these are all called ISO 8859 something. Uh, so if you see that 8859, that's what this is talking about. It's talking about, it's talking about uh, encodings that use one byte. Um, and so long as you know which Latin N you're in, um, you can understand those um, uh, characters which are encoded in the, in the higher up numbers, i.e. the things that start with a 1 in their binary representation. Or, like any of the Latin N or ISO 8859-N stuff, um, if it's one of the lower numbers, you know what it is. It's, one, it's the thing out of ASCII. Um, but if it's one of the higher numbers, you have to know which code page you're in. Um, uh, so if you're in, like, um, Central Europe, then it'll be one of them. If you're in, um, uh, if you're looking for Greek characters, uh, it'll be Latin 7 and so on. Um, this is a nightmare. This is why a load of stuff... Um, but it's so difficult because you're receiving some bytes from someone, you've got no idea what code page you're in, you guess, uh, and you get it wrong. Um, so that's why when people were trying to communicate using these things and having to say up front, well, this is the code page that I'm using and never getting it right, um, someone realized we've got to do something about this. What if I have a document that contains Greek characters and um, European characters, um, or rather, sorry, <laughs> Western uh, like the E acute. Um, well then, how do I do that? Do I switch encodings in the middle? Nightmare, 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 nightmare. So someone invent Unicode. But before we get to Unicode, let's talk about something which was kind of a rival to ASCII called EBCDIC. Um This was invented by IBM. Uh, the only rational explanation for it being continued past much past its invention is that it helped lock in customers into the uh, IBM mainframes. Uh, so this is also a code page. It's also it also uses one byte to encode characters. Um, it has various things about it that, in retrospect, are totally insane. Um, it's abcodic is actually multiple encodings that are incompatible with each other. Some of those encodings uh, don't have the letters A to Z all next to each other. So one of the common programming practices of saying if the, um, if this character is greater than A and less than Z um, won't work doesn't tell you or not whether or not those are actually that character is actually a letter. Uh, it's a nightmare. There's uh, some punctuation that you use frequently in programming that uh, is missing from EBCDIC. Um People who remember that time uh, use this word as a swear word. Uh, there is no other legitimate usage for this encoding. Uh, and then we get on to things that are a bit more sensible. So uh, Unicode is not an encoding. There are several encodings that you can use for Unicode, but Unicode is a character set. It's a list of characters uh, a list of code points. Uh, Unicode is intended to include basically all characters. Uh, it has space to include ones we haven't thought of yet. Um, so it, the idea is that uh, for any character you could think of, um, it will be included in Unicode. Um, all all living languages with ways of writing them down uh, are, are supposed to be included in Unicode. Um, I don't know whether that ambition has been met but that's certainly the intention they're also adding uh, historical languages that no one writes at, at this time in history um, they're also getting added in so they're really trying to include everything uh, as we've seen already that includes emojis and stuff that you wouldn't have initially thought should be part of a character set they just want to put everything in um, what that means is that everything about unicode is perfectly pure and beautiful and nothing can ever go wrong right well um some other things about the Unicode character set. The the first 128 characters, which the first 128 code points, uh, match up exactly with ASCII. So as we've seen already, um, 0041, or 65 in decimal, so that 41 is hexadecimal, that represents the letter A, which seems perfectly sensible, that matches up with ASCII. But actually, the seventh Unicode character, Unicode code point, in the Unicode character set, which is properly called, by the way, the universal character set. It's part of the Unicode standard, but the character set is called the universal character set, UCS. Um, the seventh character is Bell, um, which I think means make my computer make a bell sound. Um, so Unicode is already not quite as pure and beautiful as we might have liked, but that's very pragmatic, right? So ASCII uh, matches up the first 128 uh, characters in Unicode match up exactly with ASCII. 
So here's an encoding of Unicode. Remember I said Unicode is not an encoding. Unicode is a whole set of standards, including the universal character set, which is all those characters, but it includes some encodings. So here's an encoding called UTF-32. We've seen some examples of this. Uh, it's called 32 because the code units are 32-bit. Uh, what that means, because 32-bit um, numbers can be very large, is that there are enough code units that things can be really, really simple. So one 32-bit code unit uh, is enough space to encode any of the characters in Unicode, even if we add like a lot more characters. So you just, in order to encode something in UTF-32, you just take the Unicode code point number and turn it into a 32-bit number, and that's it. Extremely simple, um, but it wastes a lot of space if you're using characters that in other encodings would take up less space. Um, at one point it was thought that Unix would change so that everything was always UTF-32 because it's nice and simple. Uh, no one did that. Uh, it would be kind of crazy. You'd use up loads and loads of memory or disk space. So actually no one uses UTF-32 for anything. By the way, um, UTF-32 is also sometimes called UCS-4 um, for Universal Character Set uh, made out of four octets. Uh, and then there is UTF-16, and UTF-16 is part of the explanation for why some of the things about the Universal Character Set are pretty weird. So UTF-16 is an encoding for Unicode. Uh, the code units in UTF-16, as we've seen, are two octets long, so every single code unit in UTF-16 um, is 16 bits, hence the name uh, UTF-16. Uh, so it, uh, each code unit is two octets. And then in order to write a code point using UTF-16, you sometimes need one code unit, or you sometimes need two. So there are actually three different types of code unit that you can um, uh, encounter in UTF-16. Some of the code points just take one code unit, so it's just 16 bits in order to write that code point. And then there are some uh, uh, which are called, which are the first code unit out of two, which are called high surrogates and some which are the second code unit out of two, which are called low surrogates. So let's start off by thinking about um, code points which can be represented by just one code unit. Um, so the code points between 0 and D7FFX, they can be written with just one code unit. And then the code points that start with uh, E000 up to FFFF, uh, they can also be written with just one code unit. Um, but then the other code points, i.e. things that are larger than that, they need to be written using two code units, using a high surrogate and a low surrogate. So a little side track here, because you might well see um, this name UCS2. You remember that UTF-32 was written in UTS-4? Uh, so UTF-32 and UCS-4 are the same thing. But UTF-16 and UCS-2 are not the same thing, and they are the cause of quite a lot of confusion. So... The reason it's called UCS2, this encoding, is because uh, initially, right near the beginning of when the Unicode standard was being worked on, people thought that 16 bits was going to be enough to hold all the possible characters we might want. And before they'd even finished standardizing, they realized that was wrong. But in the meantime, everyone had gone away and implemented their stuff on this assumption that 16 bits would tell you about any character you wanted. So UCS2 was supposed to be this really, really simple thing, like UTF32 actually is, where you could write any character using 16 bits and the encoding was just write down the, the character number. Now that's totally not worked, but there is this thing called UCS2, which is basically um, an encoding which encodes a subset of Unicode, which is the subset of Unicode that can be written using only one UTF-16 code unit. So that subset can be encoded in this encoding called UCS2. So UCS2, uh, uh, any any... Um, code unit that you find that is UCS2 um, is exactly the same as UTF-16, but UTF-16 can represent a whole load of code points that UCS2 can't. So UCS2 is this horrible thing where um, we thought we could fit the characters into 16 bits and we can't, so what we've done is we've just said all those characters that we can fit um, into one UTF-16 code unit, um, that is UCS2. So UCS2 Every single character is 16 bits, and you can only represent some of the Unicode characters in there. 
sometimes to make it worse people say they support UCS2 but actually they kind of support UTF-16 so it's a total nightmare um, anyway point is the code units that you can see on the screen there from 0 to D7FF and from E000 to FFFF um, those code points can be represented in UCS2 by writing down exactly what you would write in UTF-16 for that code point but UCS2 can't represent any of the other code points, especially uh, code point numbers higher than that. Um, the bit of Unicode which can be represented with one 16-bit UTF-16 code unit, i.e. the bit of Unicode that can be represented by UCS2, uh, that is called the basic multilingual plane. That's the bit that people thought was going to be the whole of Unicode, um, but even while they were preparing the Unicode standard, they realized it wasn't, which is why they reserved that range from D7 uh, higher than D7FF, um, so that they could do more, they could do clever stuff with these high surrogates and low surrogates. So even while they were designing UCS2, they knew this is not enough characters. Basic multilingual plane is not enough stuff. It is worth pointing out, though, that almost any um, uh, um, living language, yeah, including lots of variants of Chinese and things like that, um, are in the basic multilingual plane. So you don't have to go outside the basic multilingual plane um, for many things, except, of course, for emojis, which are all outside the basic multilingual plane, and historical language and things like that. Um, but yeah, lots and lots and lots of characters, um, other than emojis, are inside the basic multilingual plane. So let's get back to UTF-16. That was just a diversion to say UCS2. Ah, uh, UTF-16. Uh, so we've talked about the code units that represent one code point. On, like what, it only takes one code unit to write a code point, but in the situations where you need to write, you need to write two code units to get one code point. That's always made out of a high surrogate and a low surrogate. So um, a high surrogate is written D8, it, or a number that's that's between D8 and DBFF. Um, so the um, the bytes in red that you can see on the first line of the example at the bottom, the high, where it says high. Um, the first bit of a high surrogate will always be 110110 and then the first bit of a low surrogate will be 110111 in binary um, and that, that maps to those numbers that I've written above DC00 to DFFF um, so that the first bit of a high surrogate and a low surrogate the first, the, in the binary representation is always going to look exactly like those red numbers and then that means you've got space to, to to put other bits in the other bits of those numbers to actually say which character you want. So you've got 12 bits being used up just to say this is the high surrogate, this is the low surrogate. And then you've got another 20 bits left to actually say which character I want. So that's the green stuff. Um, so here's an example. It's the pile of poo back again, yay. Um, so in order to write pile of poo, we, we have to write two code units. So the first code unit says, I am the high surrogate, and then has a load of green bits. The second code unit says, I am a low surrogate, uh, and then a, a load of bits for actually um, what I wanted. In order to find out what code point we're talking about, here is what you do. You, take the, you throw away the red bits, you take the green bits, and you write them next to each other. So there's 20 of them. Um, that gives you a binary number, 20 bits long. You turn that into a number. We've written it here in hex, so that gives you F4A9. Then you add a 10000 to that, um, because these characters that, that are made out of two code units are always above that. So we missed that bit out in the representation. So add on 10000, and then you get a number, and that number is the code point number. And hopefully you can see you could also go backwards from the code point number um, to get the representation made out of UTF-16 code units. Always two code units, except for the ones that are one. Um, so what this means in practice is um, the number of characters you can represent using UTF-16 is limited to um, the ones that you can write with one code unit and 2 to the power 20 more because that green binary number which is 20 bits long uh, 
is all you can use because the other bits, the red bits, are already used up just to say this is a high surrogate, this is a low surrogate. So what that means is 2 to the power 20 is the kind of highest copoint number that can be represented in UTF-16. Um, and by the way, what that means is that uh, as part of the Unicode uh, standardization process, um, the universal character set is limited to exactly that range. So there's no code point. There can never be code points above 2 to the 20 unless the standard changes. Even though the other encodings could write, could encode a lot more characters than that, um, the Unicode standard uh, universal character set has been limited to stuff that can be written using UTF-16. But you might ask, what if I want to write a code point that is um, between those ranges that are not allowed in UTF-16? What if I wanted to write code point D800? Well, the thing is, that's not a code point. So not only uh, are the code points limited to um, being less than that 2 to the power 20 number, um, also they're limited to not be allowed in that chunk in the middle that UTF-16 needs. So the, the perfectly pure and beautiful code point list of the universal character set is actually completely ugly and horrible with this big hole in it purely because the UTF-16 encoding doesn't know how to represent those characters. So, um, this, uh, the, these Unicode code points, which are supposed to be like this abstract um, list of just all the characters we might ever want to represent, has this really weird quirk in it, this big gap, where the, you're not allowed a code point with that number, because that would make it awkward for one encoding called UTF-16, which everyone hates. So, is Unicode perfectly pure and beautiful? No. Uh, Unicode, well done. Uh, you let Unifo, you let U UTF-16 ruin you. So, even while they were inventing Unicode, they realized UCS2 wasn't good enough. They made this gap where you could stick stuff that could be encoded using this thing called UTF-16. Um, Unicode is not beautiful. How sad, but we're living with it. That's what we've got to live with. Um, in practice, don't worry about it. There is a lot of space in the universal character set. Um, we are not using up much of it at all. We're using maybe an eighth of it or something like that for all the current living languages. Quite a lot of um, dead languages, a lot of emojis. We've got loads and loads of space left. There's whole swathes of it which are as big as the basic multilingual plane or bigger actually um, which are reserved for future use so we'll be okay there's probably enough space in the universal character set uh, oh and one more thing about UTF-16 in case you didn't hate it enough are we gonna write it big endian or little endian little endian Big Endian, what does it mean? Okay, so you may have noticed when we were writing down character example characters that there wasn't just one line for UTF-16, there were two lines for UTF-16. UTF-16-BE for Big Endian or UTF-16-LE for Little Endian. So uh, let me try and be as clear as I can. The order that the code units come to you is always the same. So those 16-bit those code units always come to you with like the high surrogate then the low surrogate so we're not talking about the order of the code units we're talking about the order of the octets inside the code units so let's look at this example to write pile of poo you have to have two um, code units the high surrogate and the low surrogate and the kind of natural way of writing the first um, code unit is d8 3d um, you remember um, high surrogates always um, are always numbers uh, are bigger than D8 um, and then uh, low surrogates are always numbers bigger than DC that right? let me just check that um, yeah DC so here we can say high surrogates start, uh, start you start counting from D8 low surrogates you start counting from DC um, so if we look at this um, if we look at the top line the, the BE line UTF-16 BE we can see it's D8, 3D, and then DC, A9. So that's a high surrogate followed by a low surrogate, written in the way that you would kind of expect. Um, 
but if you write it in little endian form, the octets within the code units are swapped. So you still get the same code units, the 16-bit numbers in the same order, but how you write those 16-bit numbers is either swapped around or the way you might expect. So how do you remember which one's big endian, which one's little endian? Well, big endian gives you the, the biggest stuff first. So um, yeah, you write like as if you write a number from left to right um, in my culture. Um, so I think of the stuff on the left coming first. So um, big endian numbers give, numbers give you the biggest byte, the byte that represents the large parts of that number first. Um, so that's kind of sensible. The normal way is big. So if big is better, then you could remember this as, you know, the big endian way is the better way, the sensible way. Little endian is the weird, why on earth would you do it that way? Another way that might help you remember is that um, the great, beautiful Amiga with its 68,000 68, architecture does things the big endian way, the sensible way. Also sending stuff over TCP or, or stuff over the internet and uh, does it the sensible way, the big endian way. Um, and then the weird uh, CPU architecture that we all have to use now, x86 and things based on it, uh, do it the strange, why would you do it this way way called little endian. Um, by the way, the name comes from the story Gulliver's Travels, where Gulliver comes across a society that's having a great big war um, and the war is over whether your boiled egg should be eaten by breaking open the big end or the little end. Uh, and someone was amused by uh, why people would argue about whether your CPU chipset should do things this way around or the other way around and saw a similarity um, between these things. Uh, so they called it big endian and little endian for your uh, the way you encode words. Um, a word, word means like number of octets that give you a number. Um, yeah. So if you're doing UTF-16, you have to know, is this being encoded big endian or little endian? Now, if it's just on your computer in your memory, you don't have to know because the computer just knows whether it's big endian or little endian. But if you're transferring this stuff over a network, or if you're sharing memory between computers with different architectures, um, you need to know whether this is big endian or little endian. Um, fortunately, the short answer is, if it's coming to me over the internet, it's Big Endian. Everyone's just agreed that's the way to do it. Um, so, remind me again why UTF-16 was such a good idea. Okay, so let's move on to UTF-8, which is considerably more sensible and easy to understand. Um, so UTF-8 is another encoding for Unicode. We've seen lots of examples of it already. Um, the code units in UTF-8 are just octets. So um, if if it's four octets long, four bytes long, that means it's four code units. Um, so in order to write all the characters in Unicode, you, you use between one and four code units, or between one and four octets. So uh, that, compare that with UTF-16, where we use two up to two code units, uh, and or UTF-32, where we always just use one code unit. In UTF-8, you can use up to four code units. So, some nice things about UTF-8. It's compatible with ASCII, so the, the lower down bytes, the first 128 um, numbers, are exactly the same in ASCII as they are in UTF-8. Um, so that means if you've written programs but you've only dealt with ASCII, um, your program might well still work if you feed it UTF-8. So long as your program just skips over stuff it doesn't know about, uh, i.e. essentially uh, bytes that, that have a 1 in that first position, which doesn't make sense for ASCII. Um, if it just carries on past them until it finds, say, a new line or a, a, a 0 to, say, the end of end of the, the string, um, your program will, will just work. It'll just pass those UTF-8 bytes through as if they were just characters it didn't know about. And then if it, if that if those bytes then end up going to some other bit of code which does understand UTF-8, that will still work, even though the program you wrote only thought about ASCII. So that's great. That means that some of, a lot of our old programs that only thought that way still work perfectly. Um, another thing about UTF-8, UTF which is really great, um, is that if um, some of the bytes get messed up, it's quite quick to get back on track and, and find a character that makes sense. So some stuff will not make sense if some bytes have got messed up. 
but we can easily find the beginning of the next character and carry on um, decoding from there. Um, also, if we lose a single byte, if it just goes missing uh, and uh, when we're passing it over the network, UTF-8 can recover again at the next beginning of the next character, whereas UTF-16 and UTF-32, if you lose just one byte, you'll miss a line from there on and you've got no chance. Then It's going to be garbage well, um, what you get next. Um, so lots of times to UTF-8. Um, in UTF-8, there are three different types of code unit. So all the code units are 8-bit. Some characters, some code points, can be represented with just one 8-bit code unit, for example, the ASCII ones. Um, but there are two other types of code unit. There's some code units which say, I am the first code unit out of this many. And then there are some which say, I am the non-first code unit. And they look like this. Uh, well, so let's start off with the um, code units that are represented by a single, sorry, code points that are represented by a single code unit. So, for example, again, we're back to Latin capital letter A. Um, it, that is a single byte in UTF-8, single octet. Um, there's a leading zero which says, I am a code unit which only requires one um, octet, one code unit to write the whole character. So that leading zero means there's only going to be one uh, code unit. And then the rest of the um, numbers in the binary representation tell you which a character you're talking about. In this case, they encode um, for the number 65, which is Latin capital letter A. Um, 65 is 41 hex, by the way. So um, that was the simple ones, and then the more complicated ones look like this. Um, first of all, there's one code unit, which is of that special type, I am the first of N. And then there's one or more code units, which are the, the extra, the additional ones. In this case, uh, this character, small Latin small letter E with acute, um, is made out of two code units. So it starts with 110, which means I am the first of two. And then the the second code unit starts with 10, which says I am I'm not the first. Uh, and then you've got some bytes left over, some bits left over um, to actually say which character you're talking about. So the bits left over are the ones that are neither red nor green. Um, uh, if you take those and stick them together, like we like we did in the UTF-16 example, that gives you one uh, number. And that number is the code point number. Yeah, once you in turn that from binary into a number, that's the code point number of your code point, which is U plus zero zero E nine. With me so far. So that's how you write a, a character out of two code units. It, uh, that first code unit starts one one zero. Now, if we want to write a character out of three code units, our first code unit starts 1110. So the number of ones there tells you how many code units is going to be the total. So in order to write my favorite character presentation form for vertical right white lenticular bracket spelt wrong, um, we have one byte which starts 1110, which just says I'm the, that, that red stuff that says um, I'm the first code unit out of three. And then you get some extra stuff, um, those four ones next to that. Those are part of encoding the actual code point number. So that first code unit has the red stuff, and then all the other code units, in which case there are, there are two more in this case, they always just start one zero. So that first code unit tells you how many code units there are going to be. The other code units always just start one zero, which says I'm not the first. Then all the stuff that's neither red nor green gets stuck together, uh, uh, interpreted as just a single number, and that number is the code point number. Notice, by the way, we don't have to add one zero 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 zero, um, like you did in UTF sixteen. This is uh, the the number that the code unit number is represented just directly by those binary digits that you can see there. So that was one that took three code units. Now let's look back at another favourite. Pile of poo is really a really good example to use if you're writing code that um, tests character encodings. Um, try out using pile of poo because pile of poo requires four uh, code units to write in UTF-8, so four octets. And this is how you write it. You can see there's four bytes I've written a hexadecimal, but then if we look at the binary, that's probably more instructive. So the first code unit has 11110, which means I am the first out of four code units. And then the remaining three code units all start with 101010. And then all the stuff that's neither green nor red is left over. Stick all that together. Interpret that as a binary number. 
and you get um, this number 1F49A, which is the code point number of pi of poo. So let's quickly skim through those again, just, just to give you another chance to think it through. So there are some characters which are represented by one code unit and they're binary. That's just a binary number starting with zero. And then if the binary number doesn't start with zero, that means it's going to be more complicated. So then the valid things you can do is you can start with 110, which means I'm the first code unit out of two, or 1110, which means I'm the first code unit out of three, or 11110, which means I'm the first code unit out of four. That's all that's allowed in UTF-8, although you can see this could easily be extended uh, to allow five, six, seven, or even eight code units. Uh, and that would kind of make sense. That's not allowed at the moment, but if Unicode, if the universal character set ever expands so much that we need it, UTF-8 can handle it. Also, UTF-32 can handle it. Um, UTF-16 cannot handle it. Okay, so UTF-8 is rapidly becoming the default everywhere where you care about it. Um, it's the default way of passing things between computers on the World Wide Web. It's the default encoding on most Linux systems. So maybe eventually having to worry quite so much about all this stuff will be over with. Within your programming languages, by the way, in the internal representation is quite often not UTF-8, quite often it's UTF-16. Um, but you should not have to care about that if your programming language properly encapsulates this stuff. Um, and then and the source code files that you write and save on disk of your code, uh, more and more are just uh, assumed to be UTF-8. So just in your text editor, just save it as UTF-8, um, or better still, just try and keep it ASCII and then uh, there's less confusion. Okay, so other encodings. I've talked a little bit about GB18030. This is um, uh, mandatory if you want to sell stuff um, to certain people in China, especially the Chinese government. Um, GB18030 is, def uh, is definitely not just an encoding. Actually, it's a character set several encodings but also loads of other stuff you have to be able to support so you have to be able to actually draw the characters correctly and probably loads of other stuff i don't know about um, and actually to be honest the encoding part of it if you're um if you're trying to um comply with the gb18030 standard the encoding part is pretty easy you just make sure you support unicode nicely and then just encode it in a different encoding um, which you can download from somewhere you shouldn't have to write it yourself um, uh, another um, character set uh, or code page uh, which is of interest potentially um, because it's a bit weird especially uh, is GSM 03.38 or 03.38 sometimes called GSM 7 but that is not its name it's definitely not called GSM 7 um, it's often talked about in that way because it uses 7 bits for its code units which is pretty weird instead of 8 bits like normal um, most characters uh, just take one code unit, um, but then if you provide a special code unit to say use the next code unit instead, some you get some ex a few extra characters. Um, so in GSM7 you get most of ASCII, uh, some of Latin one, but it's not compatible with ASCII. The characters are in different places. They're like some of them are a bit compatible, and some of them are in weird places. Um, there is this concept of a basic character set extension and national language shift tables. So the way I've encountered uh, GSM 03.38 in SMS stuff is, because that's where it's mostly used, um, is that um, you're using the basic character set extension. So if you want to get certain characters like a curly brace and things like that, you have to give this first, the first code unit is just use the extension table and the second code unit is which one in the extension table I want. Um, but it has the same problem as Latin, the Latin whatever ones. You have to know what uh, code page you're on uh, when you're receiving this stuff because I, I would normally be assuming I'm in the basic character set extension. But if I'm actually in a national language shift table, so I want to, I've said I want to be able to represent Greek characters or some other um, set of characters, then it's going to look the same. But actually, I'll be talking about a different character because after that, um, the special escape character saying use the extension the extension I'm expecting you to use will be one of the national language shift tables instead of the basic character set extension anyway uh, you probably don't care GSM 03.38 is interesting because it's it uses seven bits so in your SMS message your text message that you're sending on your phone if you keep to within ASCII characters uh, you'll you uh, we commonly say you get 140 characters in SMS you don't actually 
um, you, you get 140 bytes. So if you use GSM7 and you stick to ASCII, uh, you can fit in about 160 characters because you, you get those extra bits because um, it only takes seven bits uh, to write a character. So who knew that? Um, there, there's a limited number of characters representable in GSM, as you can tell. Um, so we, we will often, in SMS, we'll end up using UCS2. Uh, what's written behind me on that slide is UCS2. Uh, or this encoding called shift jizz, which is used for um, Japanese. Another hilarious encoding name, along with ebkadik, shift jizz. Um, that's used for encoding Japanese stuff. Um, yeah, so as I said, GSM 03.38 uh, it's similar to ASCII, for example, Latin capital letter A is written uh, just 4-1 using, by the way, just using 7 bits. There's no leading zero there. Um, 7 bits. Um, but it's weird. If you find an at sign appearing somewhere, then um, that, uh, especially if an at, an at sign appears somewhere where you might expect the end to be, you might well be dealing with someone who's, tra who's talking um, GSM 03.38 when you thought you were talking ASCII because the zero character in GSM 03.38 uh, represents the at sign, which in Unicode, the Unicode code point is 40 hex or 64. Um, but in GSM 03.38, that's the zero. So the zero often means I've finished, but in GSM it doesn't mean I've finished, it means at. So I bet you never knew that. Okay, so other things, yeah, if you want to get a left curly bracket, you have to do this thing I said, which is you write two code units. 1B, which means please use the extension. It's, uh, it's, that character is called escape. So you kind of escape out into the next um, code unit. And then the next code unit, actually in the basic character set extension, most of those are meaningless, but there's a few things in basic character set extension, including 2.8 hexadecimal, um, which is left curly bracket. Uh, and that's it. So hopefully that was an, uh, a slightly interesting introduction to uh, character, character sets and character encodings. Uh, so now when you get some octets from somewhere, as long as you know whether they're UTF-8, UTF-16, UTF-32 or something else, you can turn them into characters that a human could understand. Uh, if you would like to um, give me a little bit of money every time I make a video, go to my Patreon page. If you'd like to play a fun uh, puzzle action game on Android or desktop, have a look at Rabbit Escape. Um, it's free, or you can pay for it. Uh, if you want more videos, have a look at my YouTube page or my Peertube page. Google for uh, Andy Balam Peertube, or use DuckDuckGo to search for Andy Balam Peertube. You should find my Peertube page. Check out my blog where I talk about programming type stuff. Whenever I learn things, I tend to write it up there on there. Check out artificialworlds.net for my open source project, stuff like that. You can follow me on Twitter. You can follow me on Mastodon. You can see a lot of uh, open source stuff that I did on GitHub. Um, like and subscribe. And see you next time.